Hello, and welcome to episode 20 of Chemistry in 15 Minutes or Less. My name is Audra, and this review lesson is on chapter 8, Chemical Reactions. Now, some important facets before we actually talk about chemical equations and reactions, we need to talk about some things that go along with them. Collision theory is the most important which basically states that a chemical reaction can only occur if the reactants bump into each other with enough force. Think of it like cars parked on the street. You've got a couple people parallel parked against a curb. This one in here starts to move out. He bumps into this car, and then this car moves as a result. Bumps back into this car, this car moves back as a result, and then he can get out of his parking space, which, if you're learning to drive, please, please don't do that. But that's all collision theory states, is to initiate the reaction, you need some sort of energy, probably them hitting each other, like physically just ramming into each other. So other things are exothermic reactions versus endothermic reactions. You might also remember this from bio, but the quick review is exothermic reaction releases energy, and an endothermic reaction absorbs energy. The last thing is is that all reactions require energy to get started even if it's not necessarily what collision theory says, you know, with them, with the car example, them knocking into each other and bumping around, and this is called activation energy, which is just the energy to get the reaction going. Now, a chemical equation, for a definition, represents, with symbols and formulas, the identities and relative amounts of all products and reactants in the reaction. Now, products are the things that you start with in the reaction, and reactants are what you get back out of the reaction, just to make sure everybody knows what that is. But chemical equations must do three things. One, represent all known facts, meaning that everything must be identified. Two, contain the correct formulas for reactants and products, and most elements are single atoms, but you need to memorize some of these exceptions, which we'll talk about right now. Hydrogen is always H2, nitrogen is always N2, oxygen O2, fluorine F2, chlorine Cl2, bromine when it's in a liquid state, Br2, iodine when it's a solid, I2, sulfur is S8, and phosphorus is P4. Now these are things you have to know because sometimes you'll have to figure out the products in an equation and they are always like this because these ones with the twos always um, bond with themselves when in normal states and not bonded with something else and it's the same reason that sulfur has eight and phosphorus has four but those are for different things within the elements themselves. And a chemical equation also must meet the law of conservation of mass on both sides, because nothing can be lost in the reaction. All the mass is still going to be there, even if some of it is released as energy, sometimes in the form of light or heat. Now there are three main types of equations that need to be written when we're doing problems. The first one is called the word equation. Now the word equation uses only words and is descriptive without using numbers. And we're just going to follow the same example all the way through. So in this case, we're having methane and oxygen yield. This arrow is red as either yields or produces carbon dioxide and water. Now these are pretty simple. They're pretty easy to write. Sometimes this is what's given to you, or it's written out even wordier without using the pluses and the arrow signs. Now the next type is the formula equation. Now the formula equation represents reactants and products by symbols and formulas, and it also shows the physical states and reaction conditions. So, using the same example of methane, which is a gas, and oxygen, which is also a gas, yielding CO2, which is a gas, and H2O, which in this case comes out as a gas. One thing to note about this formula equation is that it is unbalanced. This is not the point at which you balance it, you do that in the last step. But some notes we need to quickly go over that we needed to memorize are things like 
If you see this, it means it's a gas. An S means it's a solid. An L means it's a liquid. A Q means it's an aqueous solution. And CR means it is a crystal. Now these are used for both reactants and products. Ones that are product specific or can be used for products only are when you use an arrow like this, means it's a gaseous product. And if you use either PPT in parentheses or a down arrow, it means that there is a solid precipitate for a product. Now there are also a whole subset of things that are used over the arrow in the chemical reaction. Those include, as you have the arrow and you have delta, this means that energy is used in the reaction. If you have the arrow and you have either some number and then ATM, or if you have the arrow and just the word pressure, means obviously pressure was used in the reaction. If you have this with some sort of formula above it, I don't know why I used C and H, but that means that there's a catalyst used. I think I spelled catalyst wrong. I always... mix that up. It means there's a catalyst used in the reaction, and that will be the formula for catalyst. The catalyst that is used. You can also have that to tell you the temperature the reaction occurred at. That'll be just whatever degree Celsius or sometimes in Kelvin. And if there are two arrows going back and forth like this, it means the reaction is reversible. Which means your reactants can become your products, and your products can become your reactants. Now those are also used in this next step, but we should cover them here before we get to that. And our last step is the balanced equation, or you can call it the balanced chemical equation. We'll just call it the balanced equation. Now, if we're taking this, this is finally where we meet the law of conservation of mass. It's your final step. So going back to our example of methane as a gas, and oxygen as a gas, yielding CO2 as a gas, and water as a gas. Now, we sometimes in class use this, but we're trying to figure out how many of each are on each side. So you list your elements here. For example, we only have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen used on both sides. So in methane, we have one carbon, four hydrogens, and no oxygens. Plus, we have no carbons, no hydrogens, and two oxygens. Now to go over on this side, you always pick whichever one is sometimes either the ionic compound or whichever one is more complex. Usually you take the polyatomic first. So in this case, we'll just do carbon dioxide first, where you have one carbon, no hydrogens, two oxygens needed. And in water, we need no carbons, but two hydrogens, one oxygen. So now as you'll see, these numbers don't equal each other. One, four, and two don't equal one, two, and three. So in order to do that, that means there has to be coefficients in front of some of these. So the one thing we don't have enough of right now is oxygen. So in order to get enough, we'll just go ahead and start by doubling it, saying that there's two H2O present in the reaction. By doing this, that means we have more on this side of the reaction than on this side, which means we should probably double our water, because that will give us two oxygen needed. But then becomes the problem. If we have two of these, then we need four hydrogens, which matches up nicely with how many we have on the other side. So because of that, the balanced chemical equation for our example would look like this. Meaning, one mole of methane plus two moles of oxygen yields one mole of carbon dioxide and two moles of water. Now that we know how to write these, we need to briefly talk about the different types of chemical reactions. 
As far as types go, there are five main ones we talk about in class. First, let's go over the synthesis reaction, which can also be called a composition reaction. It takes something simple and makes it more complex. A general formula for these will be A plus B will yield you AB. The next is, you can think of it almost like an opposite, is a decomposition reaction. This takes something more complex and makes it simple. So it would take AB and break it down into A or B. Something important to note is that these require some sort of energy, usually in the form of electricity, to initiate the reaction. The next type we'll talk about is a single displacement or single replacement, which is where you'll have a formula like this, AX plus B, and then your A and B will switch. There will be one switch, so you'll have something like BX plus A to finish out your reaction. Now the next type builds off of that, which is a double displacement, double replacement, whichever one you want to call it, which is where you'll have something like AX plus BY, and the A and B will replace each other. So then you'll end up with BX plus AY. And the last type of reaction we'll talk about is a combustion reaction which is exactly what it sounds like. It is where some sort of organic molecule, usually like a methane or a propane or something in those organic chains, plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. It's important to know that those are the products that come out of this reaction. There are other various subtypes of single displacement, double displacement, and decomposition that you will need to know, but I am not going to cover them in that video. And with that excessively large dump of information, we should conclude episode 20 of Chemistry in 15 minutes or less. Feel free to leave questions or suggestions in the comments below, and be sure to follow the in-video links, check out the playlist, or head over to my channel for more videos on Chemistry Review. As always, I hope this helps, and have a great day.